starting off, dogs with osteoarthritis will have a 20% reduction in longevity compared to dogs without osteoarthritis. That's a fact that often surprises people. But that's the value of evidence and knowledge. We know that osteoarthritis is a, a disease that affects quality of life. We know that it reduces quality of life, but we never think of it as a killer. However, that reduction in longevity is evidence of euthanasia being used as a solution for that problem. But is that right? So that's a start. Why am I here? I guess my background explains it. Um, so for 40 years, I've been a surgeon, and even worse, an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and I've dealt with all that time with referral cases. I've also been fortunate enough to be able to manage and lead large teams of referral surgeons in various hospitals in the, uh, the public sector, uh, running the QMH, RVC, and also at Glasgow Vet School, and also running some private sector hospitals for private companies and for corporates. I also was a director for five years at Fitzpatrick Referrals, SuperVet, and um, conceived, designed, built, and set up the business of the cancer hospital at Fitzpatrick Referrals. I also, uh, in one of my current interests, have kind of designed and taken to market a digital application to help the management of chronic diseases like osteoarthritis. So I can see why I'm here. I guess if we start, the pro one of the problems I see and one of the things that fuels my interest is that, it, 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 and I'm, I'm really going to be speaking from the perspective of someone who's been in the front line trying to deal with disease and how that impacts on welfare. And one of the things we're seeing now is this situation where we've been so successful in pet animals at controlling certain diseases, we now have the problem of aging populations and chronic disease problems, just like the human owners. Osteoarthritis, as I say, is one of my pet areas, but if we look at some of the, the situations here and look at the size of the problem, one in five animals, pet dogs, will have osteoarthritis. We know that osteoarthritis can is a, is, a, is a treatable and manageable disease, but the earlier we manage it, the better chance we have to deal with it. Is that what we do? Our ongoing management also will increase life expectancy. Think of the figure we started with. Against that, if we look at the, this burgeoning problem, as a profession, we, I think we fail because we don't manage this proactively. That's reflected by the way the owners perceive our efforts in controlling this painful problem, which really does impact quality of life. We're not alone with this, because the medical profession faces the same challenge. So the question, there's a concern that pet insurance may lead to quality of life compromises. We've heard some arguments already about this. And I guess we've got to try and validate that from someone who's trying to look at trying to manage a disease. And I guess when we look at opinions um, and we, we think about some of the things that are, uh, that are out there and they look horrific, um, we've got to be sure that people are properly informed and we can communicate what we're trying to do and justify why that's being done. Um, I think that you know, things like um, prolonged care with no hope of improvement, is that really what's happening? Is, or is that something more like supportive care? Supportive care rather than preventative care? Some things we just can't prevent, but we can, through supporting, manage and maintain a good quality of life. Some conditions should not be treated at all. Going back to cancer, I remember I had a very eminent colleague told me in the 1990s that we shouldn't treat any dogs with cancer. Again, that's an opinion. We've got to then say, is that a valid opinion? Have we seen, what experience of people have about seeing animals? I've been treated with cancer. 
Someone mentioned chemotherapy. Chemotherapy in animals is used quite a lot. And the people who know, have used it know that the, the side effects of chemotherapy in animals are very different from the side effects in humans. In fact, to man manage properly, the side effects of chemotherapy in animals are actually very few and far between. So we've got to make sure that we base our judgments on actual facts. And then we'll make the right judgments, whether it's for or against. Are these the things that we're, we're concerned about? Um, I mean, as, as an orthopedic surgeon, we, we use a lot of metal. We, we think we've made some advances, but we've got to justify quality of life that the animal will benefit from, um, especially in these younger animals. And it, it, this is kind of information and communication. We're able, with our advances, to sustain and, and, and keep animals alive longer while we try to resolve the, the problem. We're, we're always fighting this challenge, challenge against the disease. And we saw, this is kind of a, 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 kind of mild, mild, a mild example of someone, a paraplegic dog. Um, and, and again, whatever your view, it, it, it's kind of an option. And we've got to kind of then measure the quality of that animal's life with that situation, rather than judging it from the picture. Looking at some of the things that might influence the key decision about whether we are actually being pushed too far by what we're able to do, the expectations of clients or insured clients. And there are things that have changed, and we've seen change, as attitudes to pet ownership have changed, where pet owners see these animals as part of the family. And they almost make decisions as if they were children. Now, again, whether you, you think that's right or wrong, when you're facing them in a consulting room, you've got to be aware of this. And you, because you're, it's a very different situation from the situation we used to have. Insured clients have made some decisions about what they're going to do with their pets, so they can be more demanding because they're more knowledgeable, they're more informed. So again, we've got to be able to, to deal with that situation. Their, their expectations are, all, are also higher, because that's why they've insured their animal. They've thought ahead. And you know, one of the reasons that's commonly given for people taking insurance is that they took insurance, this is from some U, work in USA, to make sure if they had to make decisions, they were not then decisions based on financial constraints. So that's an important point. That's a decision that's been made by, by these people. Does that put pressure on us as vets to make decisions? Um, time is, kind of, uh, uh, is important. We, we go to these faster and faster consultations. We're trying to deal with these problems. And sometimes it's good that a lot of animals that come to see us in small animal practices get nothing wrong with them. Because when there is something wrong with them, we, we need time to understand the owner's situation to be able to best deal with the animal's situation and animal's welfare. And then these other things, the other pressures about this, the, 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 the kind of child substitute idea, and also another common one is where people will arrive in, in uh, feral situations with a pet who has been either dearly loved by someone who, who has recently departed, so it's a bereavement crutch, or someone who's very ill who depends on that animal. Now, these are dimensions that we've got to fight our way through and almost ignore, but still to maintain the best interest of the animal. What about ourselves? There are variables in our own situation. Personally, we may, we've got to watch that we don't have ego problems, which means to say that you know, because we can, and, be, and you know, I can, and I can't be defeated, which is completely wrong. I think you've got to be humble with these things. And the fear of failure is, is, is something that, again, as attainers, veterinary surgeons are, are high attainers, and fear of failure is something that they've actually always had. But that can't transfer to the treatment of, of animals. And also, the, the professionally, the fear of litigation, defensive medicine, making sure that everything is done to, to make sure, just to be sure nothing's wrong. And, that can lead to an increased number of investigational tests. Now, 
Optimistically, I, I, when I look at these things, I think vets are trying to do the best job. The best job is actually the best thing you can do with the resources available. And sometimes with insured animals, that means there may be a little bit more resource available. So you try to do a better job, you try to do more tests, offer more things, because you're trying to get the best outcome, not necessarily the most money. If we look at decision making, it is a balancing act. We have to take the pet owner's needs into concern. We have to take the other practical considerations. But hopefully, we can still position the pet needs above these other two concerns. And a successful outcome is the compromise between all these things, which still maintains the pet's a, a welfare. But it is a difficult process. This is a, 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 as a surgeon, this is a book I love, Henry Marsh's book, Do No Harm. He's, Henry Marsh is an eminent brain surgeon. And if, if you want to read some of the, about some of the problems that a surgeon has when trying to make decisions, which have to be made very, very quickly, read this book. Um, and he's completely honest, but he has a problem that he's got to preserve life at all costs, where we at least have the great advantage that we can make this judgment on welfare issues. But it's, it's kind of sometimes a difficult thing to do what do we make that judgment on? There are certain things that we can get wrong, and you know, health care is one of these things where you can't be completely perfect. Infections and complications are certainly things that drive the prices up. And the more risks you take, the more likely you are. But, but disease doesn't respect species. And one of the problems that healthcare is so expensive is that the bacteria we deal with now are the multi-resistant bacteria where we still cause problems on the human side. So the, our costs are almost the same as the human costs. But we must avoid these, these are actually avoidable things which can drive up costs, but also have big, big, big impacts on animal welfare. And we need to do that by being more, much more proactive on ongoing training and using evidence, knowledge and information to decide what can be done with a good outcome, how it should be done, make sure it's, it's done in a way that actually produces an outcome on a regular basis, and that allows us to move forward. And there are different ways that we can do that with standard care protocols, registers and audits, checks within the profession itself. And we, one of our big problems is we don't have these at present. We all do things our own way. How do we recognize success? Too often, it's kind of a, a nodding head arrangement in a consulting room. Do you think it's better? I think it's better. Do you think it's better? Is that really the way we want to advance? Unfortunately, we're getting much more things that are available to objectively assess pain, quality of life, to give us an idea, and then this goes back to chronic disease, where it's much, much harder over a period of time to know whether we're really making an impact on that disease or we're fighting a, a, a losing cause. But things like these clini clinical metrology instruments, which are questionnaire based, they're easy to use in practice. The Glasgow system is a very good system for quality of life. And more of these things that come on, it just gives us some more objective information to allow us to base our decisions. The system we've got is, a, is kind of based on that. It's trying to make a digital consultation to give us much more consistency as we try to deal with these disease problems over the long term. And then we can track things so we can see the picture rather than making these one-off judgments to see the picture of whether we're actually impacting on the quality of life or not, if we're being successful in managing the disease or not. What about the insurance factor? Well, high expectation of care is a selling point. If we want people to insure their animals, we've got to give them a high expectation. We've also get, it gives them choice so they can actually choose the person who they want to do the work for them, if it's a big decision that they have to go, go ahead with. And as I, I mentioned the financial security aspect. And we've got to ask, are these bad things? These are aspirations. 
aspirations to try and improve the care for an animal that they dearly love. Again, the, the assumption Simon mentioned about the, 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 what would happen if there was no insurance. And we make these assumptions that owners will only have procedures done if insurance pays. Owners will not pay any more than the insurance limit. Owners want to get a benefit, clearly. Insurance makes it easier to accept high fee producers, yeah. But if you work in, in, in the, the kind of murky world of referrals, in fact, in fact, tertiary referrals, you'll find a lot of these, your clients are insured, but a lot of them are, have actually burned their insurance out. And they're paying because they've got no insurance left. So they still want to try and make things better as long, and we've got to make sure that that is a realistic thing. We can offer them something that actually justifies both the trust and the expense that they put in us. Insurance could improve, in my opinion, by being much more transparent and easier so that the owners can actually fix their expectations much more clearly. It's the confusion and the disappointment when they find something can't be covered that can actually lead to problems when we try to concentrate on the main thing which is the problem the animal has. So I think the, the, the things could happen here. And again, we talked a little bit about, again, the preventative situation. This is disgraceful. 50% of dogs in this country are now overweight. 25% are obese. We carry some of the responsibility for this. In terms of chronic disease and quality of life, this has one of the biggest impacts on the pet population. And if we could use insurance with incentives to try and drive this down, it would hugely impact our ability to control these chronic diseases which are going to plague us in the future. So to conclude, I think that chronic disease and supportive care are things that are going to be a fact of our life coming into the future. And I think correctly managed insurance is a benefit in these situations. I think insurance facilitates better care, which is kind of what we are all trying to achieve. It certainly doesn't drive it, which is kind of one of the, the implications of the initial question. If you look at the situation in the USA, where less than 2% of animals are insured, would we say that the type of veterinary work that's being carried out there is different from what we are doing in this country? It's just funded by a different method. And I think the market itself will decide how much people will spend on insurance our job is to do the best job each time for the animal in our care and to try and support this partnership which is so important for animals and their pets, their owners. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. A few quick questions. Um, Stuart, isn't the vet's role to be the voice of the animal to articulate enough is enough where quality of life has deteriorated too far? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the, the problem with that is then the quality of life thing should be a much more objective decision and not an opinion. Because it's, it, it, if we're going to talk about subjective and objective... I think that to be confident in making that decision, which is often a big decision, then it would be much nicer to have much more objective measurements for that. As a profession, do we fail in allowing owners to feel it is OK to make the decision to be pragmatic and euthanize instead of carrying on with treatment? Can you repeat that one, sorry? As a profession, do we fail in allowing owners to feel that it is all right to make the decision to be pragmatic and euthanize instead of carrying on with treatment? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, euthanasia, as we all know, it's a, it's a great benefit, but a, a great 
purse to us. It's always a, a hard decision for us to make. We're, always, we're almost the only profession on a daily basis has to make these decisions about life or death. And I think that um, being pragmatic, doing this, trying to bring all these factors together so that we feel comfortable, that it's the right thing for the animal, and to advise the owner is kind of the best way forward. And if that means not continuing with treatment, even though we know that treatment may benefit the animal, I think sometimes that compromise has got to win. How do we deal with the cognitive dissonance often demonstrated in the small animal consult regarding a much-loved pet's quality of life? I think that, again, I think some of these, these new metrics, these new descriptors, where we can communicate what good quality of life means are very important. A, we need more time, because short periods of time to deal, this is, this is kind of quite a, a, a difficult argument to, to have, a discussion to have with an owner, especially if you're trying to persuade them something which they're in denial with. You need time to bring that around, and you need to give examples so that they can relate to different examples. So I, I think that it, it's something we have to find props to allow us to make easier because it's something that has to be done. We're not put the chicken before the egg. We say owners' expectations drive what we do. Is it not, is not the profession driving those expectations? I think it's probably a bit of both. I mean, we wouldn't be in the profession if we were not, not trying to be better and trying to achieve more. And I think that it's a balance, and, and our, our owners benefit from that. And that's the problem with stopping, because it's easy to say if something's too difficult. Someone's always got to be brave enough to keep on going. Because, the, the, and remember, the, the, the kind of difficult things to understand today are tomorrow's routine lifesavers. That's always been the way with medicine. And I th so I think there is a balance. Owners are adopting an attitude where they want more from their pets and they want their pets to live longer. We, as a profession, have got to be able to respond to that but in a way that actually protects the pets themselves. One last question. Um, did you have a quality of life review process um, you used at Fitzpatrick's or the QMH? Was quality of life only assessed by the treating clinician? I think that the honest answer to that is, in all of the places I worked, quality of life was assessed by the treating clinician. Because that's the fact of life just now. Whether that's right or wrong is a different question. I think if we had uh, a, a good system, and remember these new quality of life systems are very, very new. They're in their infancy. Do I support them? Of course I do. I've tried to, I'm trying to develop one. I think they would be a great asset to help practices make difficult decisions. If the question was asked to me in 10 years' time, and I was going back 10 years, I would hope the answer to that question would be yes, of course we did. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much. If we can... Um...